Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Psychology Capstone Showcase. Our next presentation by student Sarah Minton is the psychological impact of racial inequalities and disparities amongst Black men in the criminal justice court system and the unique burden of the unjust burden in society. This is a video only presentation. And once again, like with our two previous presentations, we will open it up for comments and questions afterward. Thank you. The psychological impact of racial inequalities and disparities amongst Black men in the criminal justice court system and the unjust burden in society. The psychological impact of racial inequalities and disparities amongst Black men within the criminal justice court system and the unjust burden in society creates a major social problem that will be researched and discussed. The psychological influence from society will also be discussed. The evident fact that America's history of racism and oppression continues to manifest in the criminal justice system perpetuates the disparate treatment of Black people, particularly Black men and Black boys. There is strong evidence that helps account and correlates for the hugely disproportionate impact of mass incarceration on millions of Black people, specifically and particularly Black men. The social and psychological perspectives in psychology will be researched and discussed pertaining to the correlations between disparities and the impact it has on Black men encountering racism in the criminal justice system. Political causes of racial disparities in the American criminal justice system will be discussed to determine why it exists, where does it come from, and what can we do about it to make a change in our communities and in society once and for all. Sadly, the overrepresentation of Black Americans in the justice system of our nation is very well documented, according to Tracy et al., 1995. Unfortunately, America's tragic and traumatizing history of documented racism and oppression continues to rapidly manifest and spread like wildfire in the criminal justice system, and the system continues to perpetuate the disparate and disproportionately treatment of Black people, but most specifically and particularly Black men. According to Tracy et al., 1995, there is noted and documented evidence that accounts for the large disproportionate impact of devastatingly extreme mass incarceration on millions of Black people, specifically and particularly Black men. It has been noted and documented that one in four Black males between the ages of 20 and 29 were involved in parts of the criminal justice system, which include jails, prisons, and currently being under parole or probation. Unfortunately, there have been several factors that have contributed to the high rate of criminal justice control for Black males, and unfortunately, this has become excruciatingly worse within the past five years, but has also remained unchanged. According to Tracy et al., 1995, it has been noted and well documented that 45% of young Black males who have been in contact with some form of the criminal justice system and remains under supervision of the system are highly disproportionate to their share of the entire population. According to Tracy et al., 1995, African-American men arrest rates are disproportionate to their share of the population by 40% compared to white men in their share of the population. According to Tonry et al., interactions documented between the correlations associated with race, crime, and the criminal justice system. There are many racial disparities in imprisonment higher rate of Black men arrested for the same crimes that white men committed, racial patterns in arrests were compared to admissions to prison. It is suggested by Tracy et al., 1995, that there are projections that point to indications that the current extreme high rates of control within the criminal justice system for Blacks will continue to be tough due to disproportionate policies and racial disparities. The psychological impacts of racial inequalities on Black men Black Americans, young boys, and men in particular face imprisonment rates that are sadly higher than whites by seven times. The causes to this are immediately well known. This is due to higher Black arrests for drug and violent crimes as opposed to the arrest of white men and white boys. Tonry, 2020, has suggested that disparities stemming from drug arrests are an immediate result from police to make the decisions to focus on the neighborhoods and the drugs that Black sell seeking to target the places the drugs are sold within Black communities and neighborhoods. Unfortunately, the disparities that are faced in prison are largely due to aggravated laws that directly prescribe sentences of unprecedented severity, 
according to Tonry, for the offenses that Blacks are disproportionately arrested. The policies and practices were particularly shaped and molded by distinct psychological, sociological, and distinctive political features of American race relations. It is suggested by Tonry that there has been work done on the psychology of American race relations, and it conveys that the multitude of white Americans resent efforts that have been constructed to aid Black Americans in overcoming the legacy of racism. Consequently, the stereotypes produced of Black criminality sustains the attitudes of whites and the way crime control and drug policies are referenced. The enumerations of discrimination, colorism, and Afro-American feature bias and implicit bias cause offenders that are Black in return to regrettably be disproportionately treated and face unfavorable disparities. From a sociological standpoint, racial stratification portrays that whites are supportive of policies that uphold, maintain, and support racial hierarchies traditionally. According to Tonry, the distribution of access to resources and the access of economic opportunities and power that span across race within the society are unequally distributed, which evidently proved that the high levels of Black men in prison faced higher arrest than whites. Among the criminal justice system and policy officers, power and control evidently exists within the vast majority, demonstrating entitlement and power trips, where control and power take over. This contributes to mental health issues to Blacks who are enlarged and entangled in the criminal justice system and causes psychological impacts on Black men and Black boys. According to Boleg, there are significantly direct effects between the history and incarceration of depressive symptoms that are directly linked and correlated between a negative encounter and the avoidance of the criminal justice system and police. Oleg has also suggested that there is a known associated link between the impact on health and correlation with mass incarceration that has been evidently proven to have an effect on the mental and physical health of Black men. When Black men and boys are faced with stop and frisks, it is proven that it's linked with negative health outcomes in Black men dramatically, and Black men are reported to have a much higher rate of anxiety and trauma that stems alongside high rates of depression. It is suggested by Boleg, biopsychosocial and echosocial show a relationship between exposures and the repeated social structures, such as negative police encounters and racism, that can severely trigger psychological and physiological responses to stress and can evidently result in poor and adverse mental and physical health outcomes in Black men. Inequalities the Prosecution on War on Drugs and Sentencing. According to Tracy et al., African-American men arrest rates are extremely disproportionate to the entire share of the population by approximately 40% compared to white men in their entire share of the population. Tracy has noted that Amer African-American males and Hispanic males make up approximately 90% of offenders that are given a sentence in the criminal justice system and sent to state prison for drug possession and drug-related offenses. Tracy et al. has stated that since the beginning of the 1980s, there has been an increase on the arrest rates of Black males, and these arrests have significantly disproportionately had a dire effect on Black American males, Hispanics, and other minorities in society. These arrests have included an increased rate of minority drug arrests along with harsh sentencing policies that have also disproportionately affected African American males. There has been a dramatic increase in the number of incarcerated African-American drug offenders, according to Tracy et al. According to Milner et al., negative perceived images in conjunction with racial profiling of Black men are already painted to perceive a Black man automatically guilty. Unfortunately, in the United States, social justice still strongly remains a constant pressing issue, and this involves the aspect that the treatment of demographic groups strongly differs within the criminal justice system. The assessment of police and suspects show that size has a significant effect on their decisions, according to Milner, which is based on the New York Police Department Stop, Question, and Frisk database. According to this database, a study was profoundly conducted and it shows true reflection that size and race account for such negative police treatment and brutality. This study, with much evidence, has in fact proven that the men that face the most risk, unfortunately and devastatingly, are descriptive as heavy, black, and tall men, and these men are the most imminent risk 
for experiencing police brutality and police force when facing an encounter. According to Tonry, higher rates of black imprisonment results in higher black arrests for drugs than those for arrests consisting of white arrests for the same crimes. Disparities of black men in the criminal justice system. The disparities of black men in the criminal justice system continues to be a major social problem in society. According to Tonry, imprisonment rates for black men continue to be five to seven times higher than those of white men who commit the same crimes. Prison disparities and laws are aggravated by laws that prescribe unjust sentences of unprecedented severity of offenses in which black men are faced with disproportionate arrests. Black men face severe lengthy jail and prison terms in the criminal justice system and face constant abuse compared to white men in the criminal justice system. Black men face overall disparate treatment, a lack of fairness, and are automatically painted guilty and often are convicted with lack of evidence, simply by appearance and skin color alone. According to Hamilton and Donovan, sadly, Black parents must take time to educate their youth and Black children. Black males specifically, on what course of action they should take when facing an encounter with an officer. Black boys and Black men are feared and automatically painted to be guilty or suspicious in even the most innocent actions, jogging, buying skittles, playing loud music, buying cigarettes. According to Hamilton and Donovan, it is stated and brought to the attention of those in society that woefully, Black parents must educate their children on what they should not do when they are approached or have an encounter with a police officer or law enforcement. It is with much devastation that Black men will historically continue to navigate their way through the racial and biased criminal justice system in society, according to Hamilton and Donovan. Five Black teens, known as the Central Park Five East Harlem Boys, who are now known as the Exonerated Five, were wrongly arrested and convicted of brutally raping a white woman jogging through a Central Park. Not only were they arrested and charged, but they were also coerced by police into confessing to a crime they did not commit and there was not any evidence that linked them to the crime. Eventually, they went on to settle a lawsuit for a wrongful conviction. However, the overwhelming and indisputable evidence which portrayed their innocence was still not enough to change the minds of the detectives and lead prosecutors. The system filled with oppression that directly contributed to the fate of the exonerated five aligns directly with the historical system of abuse, coercion, power, and control that was a breeding area for the creation of the power and ultimate control that formed and shaped the racial hierarchy that unfortunately allowed for the disparate treatment of Black men and Black youth. Psychologically, the prosecutors and detectives' inconsistent beliefs and thoughts lead to cognitive dissonance within the layers of the criminal justice system and Lugubrously, this is just one of many destructive, cataclysmic, and traumatizing stories involving Black boys and Black men and their involvement in the criminal justice system. According to Hamilton and Donovan, racialized issues of the past continue to pose challenges in society today, which is a sad, unfortunate reminder that a direct issue that thousands of Black families in society continue to struggle with daily in life. This suggested by Hamilton and Donovan that the criminal justice system is the system of oppression that unfortunately makes a direct contribution to the exact fate of the exonerated five and strongly and evidently demonstrates how the historical existence of the criminal justice system breeds and creates a racial hierarchy of power, control, and abuse. It also allows for the unfortunate mistreatment and disparate inequalities of Black Americans, but more specifically Black men. The unjust burden that African Americans face in society. According to Ewers, Black men alongside encounters in the criminal justice system have been extremely problematic and the system itself is more than fragmented, unforgiving, and beyond unfavorable. And, favorable. and unfortunately, the sad reality is that Black men continue to face an unjust burden and that this is the reality they continue to live in where entrenched racial disparities still exist. According to Ewers, the fear Black men face when leaving their homes feeling uneasy and apprehensive, the feeling of pessimism they face is devastating. The feeling of pessimism is faced with the possibility of a run-in with police or law enforcement. The odds are stacked against us. Sadly, Black men living in America face the danger and risk of losing their lives and is such a sad and devastating consequence for strictly being an African-American male in America and cops are simply outright shooting Black men and getting away with it. According to Ewers, televised killings of African-American men such as George Floyd, an African-American man murdered by a Minneapolis police officer on May 25th of 2020 by Officer Derek Chauvin, 
During an arrest, when a store clerk had suspected Floyd used a counterfeit bill, prompt black men and women to ask themselves and society if things will ever change. Sadly, with much concern, this is what black men and young black boys endure in society. Ewers has stated that black men who comply or do not comply, sadly and most tragically, find themselves in an unfavorable situation regardless. This poses the question that remains. Do white people have to have conversations with their children about what to do when stopped by the police? According to Hamilton and Donovan, racialized problems from the past continue to produce many challenges today and black families have continued to grapple with racialized issues and challenges. Black men and black boys have continuously navigated the racist, disproportionate and unjust law enforcement system with the many layers of the criminal justice system that have engaged in a downright dehumanizing process and downward spiral. The experiences of black men and young black boys can only be understood when there is an understanding surrounding the history of American society and the stigma that surrounds black identity and the development of black identity in the culture with the contemporary alignment on the theory on the development of nature and the family process. Systemic racism and brief history. According to Jackson, in the 18th century is when racism arose and into the 19th century is when it became solidified, followed by a decline in the 20th century and making an unwelcomed return in the 21st century. According to Banerjee, cognitive scientists share their urgency to address systemic racism and to shift their focus on the challenges that Black Americans face, Black men specifically. Going back in history to colonial times, explicit practices and policies have reinforced disadvantages beginning with slavery. Banerjee has suggested that racial isolation has been created by housing that has been racially segregated with costs that have been disproportionately spread out along with disproportionate networks, opportunities, along with wealth, education, legal treatment, and health. According to Banerjee, these institutional and societal systems build in individual bias and racialized interactions, which is what led to systemic racism. According to Banerjee, inferences made unconsciously, but have been empirically established from perceptions are demonstrative of non-Black Americans, inbuilt associations. This can be seen as creating and perceiving Blacks of criminal stereotypes, negative balances, and low status. This creates a system of beliefs that are racialized along with judgment that predict behavior that is racialized. According to Banerjee, it's clear that white advantages exist and coexist with power, abuse, control, and entitlement in all economic, social, and political domains. With it is noted and documented, according to Banerjee, that cognitive science has opportunity. Cognitive scientists can study systemic racism and to study the mind of distortions that exist about the reality of humans and their social groups. According to Banerjee, Racial bias continues to persist over time and account for racial bias in institutions, societal structures, mental structures of the individual, and patterns based on interaction daily. Systemic racism can exist with intent or without intent, and it can exist without awareness. This is based on racial categories that are defined socially and in fact racialized, and because they are negative in nature, they reveal the roots of racism, without a doubt. According to Banerjee, System racism is an unified arrangement of racial differentiation and discrimination across generations. It is severely necessary to understand these challenges and to dismantle and tackle them. Cognitive science can bring a light of understanding to the levels of inbuilt racial bias that exists because it has the ability through the several theories and methods. Studying and possessing knowledge of racial bias can improve science and can put society on the right path to warrant a collaborative, respectful, harmonious society that can flourish economically, socially, and politically. The system, psychology, and racism. According to Black, Black men are frightened for their lives at the hands of whites with power and control and who use power and control to abuse their power. Current events in the world, sadly, have shown that Black men and Blacks in general is still not a priority to some. Awareness is being made and will continue to be made of what's happening to Black bodies and making it a priority within the nation. 
According to Richardson, psychologists are still researching the psychological science behind racism and what role it plays in maintaining societal racial discrimination and the vast racial disparities that exist continually in important domains of life. It is questioned and continue to be well-researched whether the science of psychology can inform efforts that have been renewed to rid societal racism once and for all. It is suggested by Richardson that there is research that continues to emerge on the psychology of racism. The nature of racism is regarded on how it affects the cognition of individuals along with health and how to eliminate it. It is suggested by Richardson that new ways on the research of psychology are being highlighted with the intention creating new ways of conceptualizing and reconceptualizing the problems that exist with racism. The effects of social, structurally, and interpersonal forms of bias on the development of basic components of visual perception, along with the emergence of ethnic and racial identity. This also considers the physical health and psychological well being of racial minorities. According to Washington, Black men and brown men are impacted negatively by the criminal justice system without a doubt. Black and brown men are sadly incarcerated at much higher rates than whites and other groups within the United States. According to Washington, the criminal justice system of the United States of America is built on direct punishment and exploitation rather than building a foundation built on trust and rehabilitation. With this said, this contributes to higher rates on incarceration and specifically incarceration of black men and brown men. The recidivism rate is also higher compared to other nations that are developed. According to Washington, it is well known and documented that the criminal justice system is notorious for disproportionately targeting black men and brown men and imprisoning them. There are policies set in place within the walls of the prison that prevent black and brown men from maintaining contact with the outside world. According to Washington, in the US, the 13th Amendment prohibits slavery and servitude that is involuntary, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. This direct portion of the American Amendment has sadly been used to justify legally to enslave black and brown men in taking away their rights. They face mental, sexual, and physical abuse. Eliminating racial inequalities and disparities of black men. According to Turner, organizing is a tool that is used for and is beneficial to engage in long-term social movements and are critical and beneficial to promoting and implementing a positive and solid change. According to Turner, Activists and organizers have collaborated to increase the gain in investments within communities to globally fight to address anti-Black racism. It is suggested by Turner that without the use of organizers and activists, the question is, how have Black boys and Black men been able to fight for their own lives? According to Turner, framework must be built upon critically in education to help the fight for Black boys and Black men so they can adapt and politicize youth and peers to make a positive and solid foundation in the transformation of anti-Black racism within the community. Campaigns, groups, and movements. According to Morton, the Sentencing Project is a highly well-known profit organization nationally to promote the reform on sentencing the alternatives to incarceration through positive, productive, and beneficial programs to enhance and develop research on issues within the criminal justice system. According to Morton, the Sentencing Project addresses issues on the causes and concerns to address the consequences of the racial disparities that exist in society and within communities and provides thorough responses that are practical solutions to these problems. According to Gan Noosh, Black Lives Matter, a cry out in the light of evidence that proves the criminal justice system is not upholding the basic truth. Data that has been proven has shown that over the very last several years, it has been Blacks and Latinos who have been shot and killed by police more than half of society. Sadly and tragically, the officers who are involved in these shootings are very rarely indicted, if at all, or given sentences or face conviction. It is suggested by Gan Mooch that policies in place through the criminal justice system exaggerate the socioeconomic inequalities that are imposed by imposing consequences on individuals with criminal records. According to Gan Noosh, National March Against Police Violence, December 13, 2014. This was organized by National Action Network in Manhattan, New York City. 
This was also coincided with another march that took place in Washington, D.C. and at the grand jury's decision not to indict white police officers for the deaths of two black men that were unarmed. According to Murr and Zanoni, Black Lives Matter represent powerful truths of the ongoing and continued struggle that the black community continues to face against the structural institutions. It emerged in 2013 out of the rage of the black community for the murder of Trayvon Martin, 12 year old black boy. This global social movement is guided by many individuals that share the same values and seek justice with the change once and for all. This is the commitment to addressing anti-Black racism through actions and analyses and institutions. How can psychology address issues of racial disparities of Black men in the criminal justice system? How can psychology shed light on these issues? To have an impact on the movements and change for racism in society and within the criminal justice system, we must challenge biases that have been upheld for a long time in psychology. To do this, we must reframe the ways we think as individuals about racism to come together as a whole in society. According to Evans, there are factors that contribute, such as environmental factors, individual factors, and factors that are structural and institutional. These factors alone contribute to racism and have a contribution to discrimination. Evans has suggested that there are actions that can be taken to get rid of racism and to abolish it once and for all, to give our contribution to inclusion and equity within our communities. We must challenge our thinking and learn paths to navigate the socialization skills to connect with many who are seeking change. Once we reframe the way we think regarding racism, we set our minds and abilities to promoting a better and developed understanding within ourselves and to be open to the eyes of others around us in society. Evans has suggested that racism is viewed typically as an individual problem. However, institutional and structural factors and foundations cannot be ignored. Effective solutions can be implemented and addressed to dissect the complexity of racism. In the lens of psychology, it offers a lot to society to help address racial inequalities, disparities, racial issues, and racial biases. It is something that has a requirement of willingness within ourselves to approach these issues in a different aspect and to challenge biases that have been standing for some time. Psychology has a major impact on what we are directly seeking relief to. The application of psychology and psychological findings to social problems in everyday life. According to Evans, racism is often viewed as an interpersonal problem in everyday life within society. This means that there is a lot of work to put in to eliminate discrimination, racial bias, and hate. In our communities, we cannot ignore this problem. Evans has suggested that to address this, inclusion, equity, and diversity must be observed through the lens of psychology. Racism is unfortunately so deep-rooted and intertwined in society and often shows out in ways that may not be recognizable. Therefore, it must be deeply examined to develop solutions that are deemed effective in combating racism. According to Evans, in psychology, a direct approach must be taken to fully understand and create solutions to problems to understand biases and the effect these biases have on the solutions that are developed. Pathology should only be part of the focus and policies that are based on science should offer more range on solutions provided. Conclusion. Waging war against racism needs strictly aggressive measures and movement to address policies and procedures along with structures that make a contribute to health disparities, inequalities, the gap between wealth, access to education, and much more, specifically in the criminal justice system of the United States of America. According to Gadnoosh, actions are being implemented by the administration to address systemic racism directly and with full force to include making an advancement in racial equity within the federal government to condemn and fight racism and put a stop to it once and for all. There is a call for movement and exertion to acknowledge and directly address the legacy and perseverance of systematic racism and to review and revise practices that have been longstanding to ensure that all individuals are treated equally. According to Gan Noosh, approaches and attempts have been made to prevent and stop racism. These attempts and effort include interventions within the community, campaigns in the media, and political awareness. Our voices will be heard indefinitely.
I wanted to open it up to see if anyone has any questions. I know we're at 12 o'clock, but I think there's so much in that presentation that we can just take a few minutes um, before we break to just open it up for comments or questions. I saw that um, Brittany had a question, you know, that it's so sad that, you know, people still won't acknowledge bias and racism and prejudice in the country. How can we change the outcome if people refuse to see the truth? I mean, I think that's a great question you raised, Brittany. And, you know, psychology has told us before people can intervene, Toward, um, toward change, they first have to acknowledge and notice that something's even happening. So I think you raise a really good point. Others, feel free to use the raise hand feature. If you wanna verbally ask your question, feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat. And Dr. Johnson, who was also um, overseeing Olivia's presentation that we just saw, also oversaw Sarah Minton's presentation. So Dr. Johnson has her hand up. I'll turn it over to you. And maybe you can also talk a little bit about um, you know, Sarah's process. Absolutely. So thank you. We talked a lot about this project from again from the beginning, but um, you know, I heard throughout the entire uh, presentation, various conversations that we had along the way. One was the movie 13th and really trying to understand the institutionalization of this and the, the complete overwhelming reality uh, within the prison system. Added to that, we ended up having discussions about stop and frisk practices in part because um, I am from, I, I live in the Twin Cities. And so Philando Castile was uh, murdered about a mile and a half away from where I was living at the time. And uh, then we recently uh, experienced George Floyd's murder. And so living within this community, we, you know, uh, I, we came across different opportunities. And so I had the opportunity to tell her about some of the things that as a community that we were hearing and learning and specifically regarding Philando Castile, Philando was killed within the, um, within our, within our school district and very, uh, very specifically, they had a community meeting and um, there was an outside contract that they had with other law enforcement who came in and then killed Philando Castile within our area. Um, the interesting point of this that relates to her presentation had to do with the fact that the police chief uh, who was speaking, who was in charge of the police station where Philando was actually um, murdered, um, was able to say that he was of the only police chiefs that required implicit bias, Harvard implicit bias training of all of his deputies throughout um, every year they had to renew and had to work through implicit bias training. And he stated that he looked everywhere and could not find any other police station that really engaged implicit bias training. And yet it didn't help because the outside group that they contracted with came in without really having had some of that initial training. And so we had different discussions about some of these things and what can really happen. What, what are some of the practical pieces that could take place so that we begin to end this kind of treatment? So um, it, I just thought that might offer some insight into some of uh, what this student was stating. No, it's so, so helpful. Um, thank you for that, that context. Thank you. 